welcome to Sam Boyd Stadium in Las Vegas for EA Supercross 2000, the finals. I'm Terry Boyd, and tonight history is going to be made for two reasons. Number one, it's the first time ever for live Supercross in the comfort of your own home for the suggested retail price of $14.95. Check with your local cable or satellite provider. The other big deal, how about $500,000, a cool half a million bucks in the Vans Triple Crown of Supercross. The only rider who has a chance to do that is David Bulliman. Another rider who's made a ton of history on his own. How about seven titles? It's Jeremy McGrath. And our own Jamie Little is standing by with Jeremy. That's right, Terry. I'm here with the man, Jeremy McGrath. Jeremy, you already wrapped up seven last weekend, got it all wrapped up. You're going into this race. How are you looking at it? Uh, I think the monkey's on Villman's back now. You know, he's got the pressure of winning the 500 grand from the Vance Triple Crown. And I don't have anything. You know, I won the championship last week, so, you know, all the weight's off my shoulders. And, I mean, I'm just going to go out there and, I mean, normally for Vegas, if the championship's done for me, I, I'm able to ride really loose, so that's what I'm going to hopefully try and do. Well, you're notorious for coming out there. Even though you have it wrapped up, everybody is saying, oh, he's just going to go out there and ride around, whatever, but you want to come out here and you want to win this. So what happens if Villeman's on your back tire? Is it a battle? You guys coming down? You going to hold him off? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, every year when I win the championship early or if I do and... You know, everyone says, oh, yeah, he's just going to cruise into Vegas. And, you know, by now, everyone should know. It's been, what, 10 years? Everyone should know my style by now. I don't I do not do that. I, I'm coming out to win each race and each weekend. And if David's on my tire, I'm going to do the very best I can not to let him win. You've held him off four times. Perhaps you can hold him off tomorrow night and get your 70th win. He has 69 Supercross wins going into this race. Yeah, it's... That's quite unbelievable, you know. I'd, who would have thought that? I mean, I, when I was little, all I wanted to do was race Supercross. I never, <clears throat> never imagined of having, you know, seven championships. The amount of wins I have, it's, it's crazy. I don't even understand it. I know, and you know, people always want more. And I know people have asked you right when you win your seventh championship, are you going to be back next year to do it again? You know, I mean, every year I race, I'm going <clears> to <throat> try and win the championship. I'm not coming out to have a farewell tour or anything like that. I, I mean, I'm not even thinking about retirement yet. I, got, I still got, obviously, I can win nine races, you know, this year. I mean, obviously, I'm a dominant factor in the series. And even though I'm a lot older than the guys, I, you know, I don't feel it. Well, Jeremy, we're happy to have you out here. First time on pay-per-view. we got a lot of viewers that are going to be tuning in mm -hmm. to watch you. A lot of them know your name but don't even know the sport of Supercross. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's our first time. It's going to be live, and, you know, we're going to get some, some new fans, I'm sure. All right, there you have it. MC, I'll send it back on up to you, Terry. Team Yamaha's David Fulliman hopes to hit the jackpot tonight in Las Vegas with 500000 bucks. Well, as usual, he was French cool about the whole thing. Yeah, I know everybody don't want me to, to win this money, but I don't care too much. I don't care too much about the money. I just care about winning the race and have fun. And uh, I'm not sure that that would be a great bonus for me to get this triple crown. But I will try to to win like last week, and I rode good in uh, Joliet. I had a bad luck on the start, but I came back second and. Hopefully, if I can ride like that and uh, start top three, I can win the race. Yeah, I'm not a gambler. I just, I just want to put this money in my bank account, and uh, my bank uh, will be very happy about that. I want to win very bad, you know, because you know last week I had like bad luck, but uh, I rode a good race, and I want to win. I want to, I want to race with Jeremy because it's a lot of fun. In a city that's been built on dreams, cash, and numbers, one man hopes to cash in on all three in the Vans Triple Crown of Supercross. The cash is $500,000. The dream is David Vullemans from Team Yamaha. He is the only guy with a chance to win that $500,000 put up by Vans Tennis Shoes. It all started in Phoenix, Arizona, then it went to Minneapolis, and it wraps up here tonight in Las Vegas. If he can win tonight, because he's already won at the other two cities, he gets $500,000. Odds are, though, 19 other guys don't care about David's financial future. They care about their own, and they're vying to knock him out of that number one spot. Well, I'm not a Bulliman fan, so uh, oh. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, you know, I mean, this is my last chance to win a race, and, I, and I'd love to do it so he doesn't. So, But uh, I'm ornery, so we'll, we'll just look at it that way. Yeah. Well, he was there last weekend, and uh, you know he made a pretty aggressive pass on me with the last lap to, to uh, you know get in the second place. And uh, you know I, I'm pretty sure that he realized that he's got a pretty big target on his back, and hopefully, uh, hopefully I can be there to, to return the favor from this weekend and take that half million away from him. 
Well, I haven't won a race all year. I've won races the last two years, so I'm going to do whatever it takes for me to win. For me to win would be more important than $500,000, so I'm going to do whatever I can to win. If I can't win 500000 I don't want no one to win 500000 <laughs> Remember, you can see Jeremy McGrath along with David Vulliman and all the stars of the EA Sports Supercross 2000, the final round here tonight in Las Vegas. All you have to do is contact your local cable operator or satellite provider for the suggested retail price of $14.95. You get it in the comfort of your home. Forget about it. We're sold out here tonight. The only way to see these stars is in your home tonight, live pay-per-view. Local cable operator operator, local satellite provider, suggested retail price, $14.95. Now, besides all the stars that are riding, we're going to catch up with Jimmy Button, see how he's coming along in his recuperation from that crash he had in San Diego at round number three. And let's talk about the track for a moment. This is the largest track in the history of Sam Boyd Stadium. Pace Motorsports has gone through the roof with a track tonight. And for more on that is former 250 Supercross champion and 500 Outdoor National champion, David Bailey. From the start right here, you've got a 100-yard dash to a tight first corner, 180 degree, and back through a tough rhythm section. Right here, you make a 90 degree left and head into some sand. And then something new this year in Vegas, they actually go outside the stadium right here, over a big tunnel jump, which sets right here. And as they come back into the stadium, there's a triple in this section right here. They hit at speed. But the first really big triple sits right here, 70 feet across there into a right-hand turn and a whoop section split up by a double jump right in the middle, something we haven't seen so far this season. Another triple down here before heading into what I believe is the toughest section of the evening, this whoop section, which goes all the way down the straightaway leading into the finish line turn. After the finish, they'll make a right and head back into the first corner. Oh, man, is it an awesome track. And I'm telling you, folks, for the suggested retail price of only $14.95, contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. Hey, you don't have to take my word for it. I mean, I'm just some schmo with a microphone. Let's go to the guys who have the real deal. Actually, I think the track looks good for uh, Vegas. Vegas is normally a, a small stadium, but they've come on the outside of uh, the center box in there, and, and, uh, and they run the track lanes a long way. So. I think it looks good. It's going to be a longer race than normal, and I think it'll be a good race. Well, it's a good track, uh, a lot like California, where we're used to really hard pack. So uh, I think it's going to be good for me because I do good on the hard pack, and I'm looking forward to it. It's actually a lot better than it has been in the last couple of years. You know, it's dry as always out there, but uh, that's just Vegas dirt and Vegas weather. But the track actually comes out of the stadium, which makes it longer, which, you know, help, helps us out. It, it sucks to have, you know, a tight course. So, you know, we got some straightaways to relax on and, you know, just to get a break and come back into the stadium. The track's good here. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty technical. The dirt's hard, and uh, it's going to take some smooth throttle out there. But uh, I'm very confident in my bike, and, and uh, the Honda's working great for me. Hopefully everything works out. Yeah, the track is pretty tough. Um, going to be hard to pass again. So uh, they're going to be pretty hard to do the difference. It's a good start would be very important. So we'll see uh, what happens, but the all shot going to be... Uh, a good key for the win. Track's great. Uh, the dirt, you know, they have a hard time with the dirt here. It's so windy and hot, but the obstacles are really good. I think we're going to have a fun race. Yeah, the track's pretty good, and we go out of the stadium and a pretty fun, like, outdoor section and a uh, pretty nice jump and a pretty long start also. That's good for me because I do not like the short track. Hey, we're only minutes away from making history tonight in Las Vegas. EA Sports Supercross, the finals. What an incredible night in store for you. Come on, folks, contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. As a matter of fact, let's take a trip down history lane, memory lane with Art Ekman and how we got here to Las Vegas. By the bar for a second, McGrath looks back at David Villeman. The 2000 EA Sports Supercross season began with the age-old question, who would unseat Jeremy McGrath? Honda's top gun as Relust crashed in the opening practice session, out for the year. Left, his teammate Kevin Windham. Kawasaki's Ricky Carmichael. Yamaha's David Villeman. And veteran Honda rider Mike LaRocco. Before a sold-out crowd in Anaheim, Showtime set the stage and put his understudies on hold with two dominating wins. LaRocco hung tough, finishing second and third. But it was Villeman who would meet McGrath's challenge, winning the next two rounds in San Diego and Phoenix, moving to within two points of the six-time champion. I prove, uh, you know, tonight I can win uh, when Jeremy is uh, up front. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, a good step for me to get that. And, uh, 
so we'll see in a couple of weeks if I can do the same. McGrath fighting the flu and upset with his performance went on a tear winning the next four races leading all 80 laps while Villeman and the rest struggled to keep pace. Yeah, David was riding good those two races and I mean he's granted. <coughs> Excuse me. He's still riding really good, but you know I just had a little bit of problems at those races and my starts are coming back. I mean the bike's working really good. Carmichael was the next to challenge McGrath's supremacy. At Daytona, in front of his fellow Floridians, Ricky won his first 250 Supercross race. Although he was out of the title hunt, he had beaten McGrath. I had to work for it. Jeremy was right there on my tail the whole time, and, uh, man, I just gave it 100%, and I wanted to go as long as I could, and I made it past that halfway, and he started falling back a little bit, but he don't have to win. He's won plenty of them. McGrath responded in his Trey Clark manner. Another win in St. Louis, his seventh of the year. But Villeman came back in round 11 with his third and biggest win of the season in Minneapolis. Keeping sight of McGrath, he had now won Phoenix and Minneapolis, the first two legs of the band's triple crown. A win next week in Las Vegas, and he takes home a half-million-dollar bonus. Everybody told me that when I arrived here. So it motivated a little bit more, and uh, I got a good start. And uh, so uh, everything uh, going very great here. And uh, now I'm thinking about next week. But it was back to normal the following week in Pontiac with win number eight for Jeremy. Villeman finished fourth and lost precious points in the championship race. We've come a long way, and I think this year is probably my best year so far in three years. So. It's looking good. I'm happy to do what I'm doing for Yamaha. Remember Kevin Windham? McGrath called him one of the most talented riders on the circuit. After a disappointing season, Windham came alive at Dallas, winning his first race of the year. He had proven that he indeed belonged. It's been a real long time, and, uh, you know, I don't care if it came at the last race or the, this race or any race. At this point, I'm just glad to uh, you know, be on top of the podium, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's just it's overwhelming. I've been beating my head against the wall for so long, and uh, finally I've come out of the slump. Two weeks ago in New Orleans, McGrath and Pulliman staged an awesome battle in the Superdome. The kid from France beat the champ, forcing a showdown in the Windy City. Jeremy hadn't clinched a Supercross title with a win since 1996. But in Chicago, it was obvious from the start that he was not going to let the presentation of the number one plate be delayed to the final round. Things were decided early when David Villeman got hung up behind Ricky Carmichael crashing in the first turn. Catching McGrath seemed impossible with the Frenchman emerging in 18, but he would soar to within two seconds of the celebrating McGrath. The sports icon set the fireworks off his seventh title in eight years. Well, that's why they call him Showtime, and that's why he's the king. With seven titles, Jeremy McGrath, another phenomenal season. But I'll tell you, that's not all the racing we have. No siree, it's not all 250s. We got the 125s as well. Let me throw some names at you. How about Rincata? How about Bentley? How about Pastrana? That's right, the best riders vying for bragging rights between the East Coast and the West Coast. But you can't see it unless you contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. As a matter of fact, first race goes off right around 7.30 tonight, 10.30 East Coast time. Jamie Little standing by with the East and West Coast champions. That's right, Terry. I'm here with both champions. Yeah, you see fights on pay-per-view, but we got two champions battling for the 125 title here. We got Shea Bentley, the 125 West champion. 125 East, Stefan Rancata. What's it going to be tonight? Uh, it's going to be good, you know, I think I'm going to try to uh, make it to the first turn on two wheels and uh, we're try to win the race and uh, pretty 120 percent and put my Yamaha off trail on the highest, uh, highest rank of the podium. So what are you going to think if uh, Shea here is on your back tire? I'm not going to think, I'm just going to go forward and not look backwards. All right, how about you? He's just going to go, he wants to take it, Shay. Uh, I'm not going to let him go. My Kawasaki Pro Circuit Split Fire bike's running really good. I'm going to stay close to him. I think we're going to have a really good race. However it turns out, um, I think we're going to put a show on for the crowd. All right, we got a 125 battle going on for the East, the West. Who knows what it's going to be, Terry? It's getting ugly. That's right. It went down to the wire on both the East Coast and the West Coast 125s. You needed as many as five different clocks to try to figure out who was going to get the title. As a matter of fact, Art Ekman was there for every single one of those races. He called the action. Art, what do you think is going to happen tonight in the East-West shootout? 
Well, Terry, the 125 division had more parity than ever before. For the first time in the history of the 125s, we had nine different riders win races. Six of those were first-time winners, and an incredible fact as far as the guys that got hole shots. In 15 races, we had 14 different riders get through that first turn quickest. Shea Bentley won the 125 West by a mere two points. Stefan Roncata, the 125 East, by four points. You combine that total, and it's the slimmest margin in 125 history. I think most people would agree that season long, the 125 division was much more exciting than the 250 division was. Now, the 125 shootout in years past, they used to compare who's the better champion, the East or the West, and then they had a supporting cast of riders. This year, it's up for grabs. Anyone can win. I wouldn't be surprised if Brock Sellard's a non-winner or Nick Way or Danny Smith took the victory here. The odds-on favorite, though, is Stefan Roncata. He's the hottest rider on the 125 circuit right now. He's the winningest rider with four victories. But you can't rule out Travis Pastrana. Things happen around him when he is on the track. He loves the spectacular. This is right up his alley, Terry. And if I had to go out on a very, very shaky limb, I think I'd go with the rookie pro. Wow, what a night tonight. We are talking about EA Sports Supercross, the finals. You need to contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. One rider that has absolutely leapt onto the 125 scene is freestyle motocross rider extraordinaire Travis Pastrana. As a matter of fact, he's standing by to throw a huge Superman seat grab Indian air with Jamie Little. Hey, Travis. Hey, how's how it going? Doing, Good, Good, how's it going? Robins. Saw you out there, you know you're practicing. We're here in Vegas with Travis Pastrana. He doesn't need an introduction. Rookie year, tell us about it. Man, it was just a really great rookie season for me. I didn't know what to expect coming into this uh, Supercross season, but I had a lot of support from American Suzuki, and it's just been, man, the whole season between Sellers, Roncada, and myself back and forth battling every single race, and I ended up coming out in the, the short end of the stick and third, but still for my first year, you know, I made a lot of mistakes, but I feel like hopefully here in Vegas, it's a great track, and I can have some fun and maybe win this thing. Hey, we've some, seen some of the best 125 racing that we've ever seen, I've personally ever seen, and you came out there and you won two races. Not bad for a rookie. Oh, no, I was really <laughs> excited. I couldn't say anything more, you know. I just, when you get up, I won Daytona, which has been my goal for a long time now, and to do that my first year, uh, I had a lot of support, like I said, from Suzuki, so I couldn't ask for a better year. Um, hopefully, you know, going into the outdoor season, this would be great, and this pay-per-view special, and this is huge. Everyone's here. It's going huge, and you know what? The championships are already wrapped up in the 125 and 250. However, there is one race still to go. It's 125 shootout, the best of the East and the West. What's it going to come down to? Man, it's good for sure bragging rights. This is the biggest race of the year for the 125s, East versus West. No one knows, you know, who's going to do what. There's going to be some surprises. It's definitely, it's a technical track out there, so it's a lot different than we've seen. So it's definitely going to make some bar banging action. It should be a lot of fun. Now, there's some parts on the track out there that the 125s are having a little bit of difficulty on, but you are always one of the first guys to make that triple no matter what. You always get the fans behind you right off the bat. Oh, well, definitely. They have a long, really, really long whoop section, and they have a triple, two triples on the track that none of the 125s have done yet. So it's going to be a lot of big air out there, but um, hopefully I'll, you know, I have... Uh, a lot of confidence that I can, in my jumping ability, so hopefully we'll be able to go out there and do some triples. Well, let's talk about that jumping ability. A lot of fans, viewers out there right now, they've seen you in the X Games, the Gravity Games, going off. This year you made the transition to racing. What was that like? Well, racing has been my dream my entire life since I was four years old. And, you know, just this year I got a factory ride at 16. I couldn't ask for anything better. And I'm still doing the jumping for fun. It's just, you know, hanging off the bike at uh, 30, 40 foot in the air. That's cool. But uh, racing, that's where I really want to be, and that's where I'm focusing and training hard for. So will we see you then after this, you know, Supercross series? You have the Outdoor Nationals. Will we see you in the X Games? Yeah, actually, I should be doing the X Games. Um, hopefully, I'm not sure. It's definitely on a week off, though. So um, if Suzuki lets me, I think I'll be doing that. All right, Travis. It's been great watching him this year. You'll see him tonight on pay-per-view. Thanks, Travis. Definitely. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Appreciate it. Man, Travis Pastrana is going to be going off big in just minutes. And I'll tell you what, the first thing you need to do, contact your local cable operator or satellite provider for the suggested retail price of only $14.95. You can be following the best riders in 125 and 250 Supercross. It's a history-making event. First time ever for live pay-per-view Supercross television. As a matter of fact, we asked the best riders in the world how they feel about doing it live for the first time ever.
gonna oh I, yeah all my friends are watching it they can't wait it's uh it's awesome it's i mean it's uh it's on what is it mtv and vh1 they're uh advertising and stuff that i've seen on a bunch this week and uh all my friends are uh are uh, renting it, and uh, I know some restaurants in town are having it on, and it's gonna be—it's awesome. Uh, how cool would it be to win that race? Oh, it'd be—it'd be awesome. I, I, I'm planning on winning, so I'm gonna—I'm gonna be up there for sure. I think it's gonna be great on pay-per-view. My mom listens to the announcers on on the computer every weekend and next weekend she'll be able to it, i don't know though my mom's pretty cheap she might not spend the 20 bucks but i'll have to lend it to her i definitely buy it just gotta love racing stuff so. yeah i can't wait i'm actually gonna uh gonna have my friends record it and uh, i'm gonna go home and check it out but i'm, I'm excited about it i think a lot of a lot of my friends are that uh you know can't make it to vegas they're really pumped to, to stay at home and uh, and watch it so i think it's a good thing i'm interested to see how it turns out do you think you'll get any calls from your dad or maybe some of your friends like in between heats saying jeremy's doing this so you gotta do that i i don't know that's that's interesting you know everybody here at honda's got the video cameras rolling and uh you know we got got it pretty much covered if anybody does anything different but uh you know, that'd be kind of cool uh, you know it's kind of bad sometimes too because you get off the track and if you do good you want to call your dad you know hey i did this i did that and he's all i know i was watching it's like damn i want to be the one to tell you but it's gonna be it's gonna be neat and it's gonna be exciting and i think uh it's, it's good for the future of supercross Remember, you cannot catch all the action of EA Sports Supercross 2000 Finals unless you contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. We're only minutes away from the race action tonight. As a matter of fact, we're going to give you a view of what it looks like to ride one of these awesome Supercross tracks like we did in Chicago with Heath Foss. are tearing up what an awesome ride and i'll tell you what if you don't contact your local cable operator or satellite provider you're gonna miss out on this wild ride as a matter of fact let's build a little history we'll take you back to 1999 and last year's final here in vegas <laughs> Yeah. 
Jeremy McGrath had already clinched the championship when the gate dropped in Las Vegas for the final round of the 1999 Supercross Series. But second place was still up for grabs as Ezra Lust, number four, trailed Mike LaRocco by 12 points. LaRocco needed seventh place finish to shut out Lust, assuming Lust went on to win the race. McGrath wasted no time at all in upsetting the equation with this early pass for the lead. Bad for Lust, good for LaRocco. He now needed only to finish ninth. Whoops coming up, and Ezra's backward slide continues. This time, the pass was made by Larry Ward. But Lusk, despite a near crash, kept his cool and was able to pass Ward back. Meanwhile, number nine, Ricky Carmichael, had visions of a podium finish. Unfortunately, youthful exuberance got the best of him, and the first-year 250 rider went down hard. But the worst is still to come. Greg Albertine never saw Carmichael crawling back to his bike. And as we take another look at it, it's obvious Carmichael never saw Albertine. Carmichael would return to the race, where he would ultimately finish 19. Back in seventh place, number three, Mike LaRocco is about to lose series runner-up honors. Watch again as LaRocco miscalculates the jump and lands in the bales. LaRocco would end up 17th in the race and third in the final standings. For McGrath, the checkered flag was the end of another championship season, his sixth Supercross title and eighth win of the year. Another win for Jeremy McGrath and yet another title. Seven titles for the king, Jeremy McGrath. And all this action could be yours in the comfort of your own home. Contact your local cable operator or satellite provider. We're talking about three hours of incredible race action. And I'll tell you what, even if you were here, we're going to take you places you couldn't go anyway. Here's a tribute to the king as we get ready to go racing. My plan to go out there is not only be the fastest guy or be one of the fastest guys. Oh my God! But my plan is to be smarter than everyone else. Look at the focus and the intensity in the eyes of McGrath. By the bar for a second, McGrath looks back at David Villaman. And Jeremy just looked over at Villeman and rubbed it in. Can they stay with Jeremy? I know he's a rider that gets real confident, and, and when that happens, he's really tough to beat. He knows when it comes race time, he can win. He's got so much confidence over everybody. Hopefully, uh, one or more of us can, can take him down and uh, you know make, make it interesting. I want to come out and whip these guys, period. Our leader, Jeremy McGrath, just simply pulling away. He can just mail in second. He is so strong. The winningest rider in history. And the checkers are starting to wave for Jeremy McGrath. He always seems to find a way to go just a little bit faster than the next guy. But McGrath right there, just giving a clinic. McGrath the king once again for the seventh time at Supercross. I mean, anybody, I can beat him one race. Anybody can beat him one race. It's beaten him 16 races, and that's why he's champion. Very dedicated, very consistent, focused, knows how to win. Knows how to win. Last week, David Billiman lost the EA Sports Supercross Championship to Jeremy McGrath. All the glory went to McGrath, his seventh championship. But tonight, it's all about money. If Billiman can beat McGrath and the rest of the Supercross stars, he will win the Vans Triple Crown bonus of $500,000. But it won't be easy. He made an aggressive pass to uh, Villeman that is on the last lap, you know, to, to, uh, to go in the second. And, uh, you know, I really hope I'm in the same position next weekend to, to try to take the 500 grand away from him. 
The best 125 Supercross riders in the country are also on a collision course. Once and for all, they'll line up to see who's the best in the East and West. EA Sports Supercross winds up a wild season of racing from Las Vegas next. Hello, everyone, from Las Vegas, Nevada. Our Deckman, David Bailey, Davy Combs, and Robbie Floyd ready to bring you the first pay-per-view in the history of Supercross. We told you that we'd see all the action with the 125 East Riders are at the gate getting ready to go. David, let's take a look at the track. Well, it's a great track here in Vegas. This year, they've made a few changes. It's going to be a 100-yard dash right to the first corner. That's a tight first corner with the speed they're going to be coming in. You can see that right here. Then they go through a rhythm section to make a left here. you got some sand. Then they go outside the stadium, a big, fast section there with a tunnel jump right in the middle of it. The first triple. Another triple down here at the bottom, the whoops, leading all the way to that last corner of the finish line. Once they go around the finish line, they'll make a right, go back into the first corner. Each division has their own qualifying heat in the LCQ. The East Division goes first. The top nine riders get set to transfer to the main event. The two top riders out of each last chance qualifier will fill out the 125 shootout 22 rider field. Here we've got the champion Stefan Rangata, Rangata from the East. Brock Sellers, the runner up. Travis Pastrana, the exciting young rookie who won Daytona and St. Louis. Nicholas Way, Ernesto Fonseca, and others. We're ready to go with the first action of the evening from Las Vegas. A great start for Brock Sellers. Tyler Evans jumps in there and steals the lead away from those guys. Olaf had the lead momentarily, but Pastrana's right in there, Art. And they go in that new section of the track outside the stadium, over the tunnel. I love this. This adds about another 10 seconds to the track. Look at all the air time they get. They jump, pre-jump actually to the tunnel, all the way over at Pastrana, already making his moves. Tyler Evans, our leader. <laughs> Pastrana right behind him. Tyler Evans takes a look over his shoulder. He needs to know who's in second. That'll change the way he rides. He left the door wide open there. Here's Pastrana. Pastrana battling part of bar. And Evans down back in second place. Now, when he looked over his shoulder there and saw that was Travis, he should have gone inside. I don't think he was really set. He was committed to the outside. Pastrana reaches up, pulls one of those tear-offs, to clear his vision. It looked like it didn't come off in time. Ron Cotta has moved up to fourth right now, had a very difficult start. There's Evans, number 45, as we take another look at the beginning. Uh, right in the middle of the pack. See Fonseca right there getting tangled, goes off the racetrack. Want right, that number 28, cool. yeah, he's been running number one all year in the East Coast. Here he's got to switch to 28 because his teammate, Ron Collins, is running number one. Back outside again. Tyler Evans staying pretty close to Pastrana right now. He's been able to do that before, but usually about midway through the race, Pastrana's just got a little bit of a risk and able to pull away. The battle for third is on now. Travis Pastrana pulling away. Tyler Evans safe in second place. And we've got Joseph Aloff and the uh, champion from the division. That's Stefan Moncada. Moncada moving into third now. Moncada's got the speed. He can catch those other two guys, maybe. He's definitely got the speed. I'm not sure if he's going to have enough. Eight, six laps. May not be enough time. He's definitely going to send a message to Pastrana out front if he can gain time on him. And that Pastrana will know that Moncada's faster. That'll wear on his mind a little bit before the main event. Ron Cotta, the winningest rider in the 125s this year with four victories. He had five podiums. He also led the most laps of any 125 rider with 46 on the season. There you see number 23, Nick Way. Way took a third place here in Las Vegas last year. He is solid. He's a lot like Morocco in the 250 class this year for Way. He's been so consistent up front and he really liked to win. He's just coming up a little bit short here and there, but he definitely made a big improvement over last year. Yeah, he hasn't finished out of the top five all season long. And we go back to the battle right behind him. Aloff and Hatzel. Olaf doing a great job. Big 
Big advantage, though, to get the start. You can get a great start, even if you're not capable of running the pace of the guys out front. Even if they get by you, you still got a good spot getting into the main event. You're able to run out front and see what the leaders are doing and adjust your lines accordingly. Battle for fifth is on. Joseph Aylor and Tyson Hatzel. Hatzel cutting to, cutting to the inside. That's number 412 is Tyson. Aylor's starting to lose some time now, but he's still going to be able to get that lead as long as he can keep it upright. And out front, Pastrana is awesome. He's been able to jump some stuff. He's doing it in practice. No one else has really been able to match it. You can look at him right there. Starting to get a good lead over Evans here. Travis Pastrana, so effective in his first year. Mr. Pure Excitement. He's got the flash, the speed, the jumping ability, and the never-give-up spirit to really become a great champion someday. He's already got top billing in most everything. That's unbelievable. He comes into the stadium, everyone just screams on the top of their lungs because they know they're about to see something exciting. Forget the maturity of this kid on camera that he's only 16 years old. That's the triple I'm talking about right there as he comes back into the stadium at speed. He's getting over that, which sets him up for this triple here. Did you hear the crowd react? Pastrana with two wins and five podiums. If he holds on, this would be his seventh heat win of the year. He's definitely dominated the heat races and looks real relaxed right here. When he's not having to put his foot down in the corners right there, that means that he's real confident in his balance. He's getting through those whoopies faster than anybody so far. He's already got more than a seven second lead, about a 7.5 second lead as we take a look at the battle for third right now. Evans and Way. Evans number 45. Nick Way on the pro circuit, Kawasaki right behind him. You see Evans has cut the sleeves of his jersey a little bit. These guys are having to roll this big finish line double because the rider had gone down earlier. That was Paul Carpenter. Looks like he's going to be all right. Evans doing a pretty good job of blocking Way. I don't know how long it's going to last, though. Art. Nick Way cuts to the inside, and Nick Way moves up another notch into third place. Can Evans come back? I don't know that he can. Way was able to catch him from pretty far back, and I think what's important for Evans right now is just to relax, get into a good group, and study what these guys are doing that are doing to him that they're getting past. Try to use those lines in the main event. Evans had a fifth at Pontiac, who led the race with three laps. Nick Way. Good speed. This is a great speed track. Now you can see the difference, though, from these guys to Pastrana out front. Pastrana able to triple the jump as he comes back into the stadium. Triple this right here as well. And that's about two seconds to lap. Love that section, though, as they go out of the stadium. They get these bikes in third and fourth gear. A super pass by Nick Way, David. Let's take another look at it. Nick Way, skies. Well, they had gone over the finish line jump, and... Tyler Evans decided, nope, you're not going to get me here. But what he did was he came into the corner so tight he had to go wide. He couldn't really get set. Way was able to set him up right there, squared him back off, and made that pass. That's easy. Back to our leader, Travis Pastrana, as he goes outside the stadium on the final lap. Our first qualifying heat for the 125s. Don't forget the top one. Get the transfer to the main event. The rest go to the last chance qualifier. We'll have the 125 West Riders coming up next. Look at this triple right here. That takes so much finesse to be able to get that 125 up and over there. And most of the guys in this 125 class aren't able to jump the triples, and he's able to do heel clickers off these things, so he's obviously very comfortable with the race. <laughs> As the fans on the near side standing on their feet as he does the night night. He's always having fun out there. I think he might be having even a little bit more fun this time. He can redeem himself a little bit by a win here tonight and cap the season. It's probably all anyone's going to remember. Anyway, he wasn't able to win that championship. The checkers for Pastrana, the first winner of the evening. And the first winner ever on live television. He's happy. He's yeah. got to be happy. Stefan Rotkata <laughs> comes over in second place. And Nick Way now is headed toward the finish line. Let's go down to Davey. Thanks, Art. I'm down here with Lee McCullough. Lee, Travis comes out firing. I got to ask you, you think the heat bothers him at all? Uh, no, he's been riding out here in California and, you know, near the area. So the, he says the heat's all right. He's not affected by it. And, uh, you know, he feels good. He's been doing a lot of riding and training for the outdoors, getting ready. So he's in good shape. He's in great shape. All right. Thanks, Lee. All right. 
So Heat 1 goes into the record books with Pastrana, Rancata, and Way, the top three riders. As we take a look now at the wrenchhead.com results page, there you see the top three. Evans also qualifying to go to the main event. Brock Sellards will be on his way to the main event as well as the top nine graduate. Brandon Jessamine just on the bubble beating Joseph Aloff. You see, I was noticing the lap times. The best lap by Pastrana was a 112. The best lap by Roncata was a 113. And Roncata was trying hard to catch Travis while he was out front showing off for the crowd. So looks to me like those were the two guys that I expected to be the fastest out here from what I saw in practice. Travis has the upper hand. Well, it's a good start on our 125 shootout, don't you think, David Coombs? Yeah, it sure was. But you know what? A few guys had some bad luck in that one. Paul Curry, the Plano Honda rider, pulled out on the first lap. Then we also saw Chris Wheeler, who was in a qualifying position on the KTM, looked like the throttle cable pulled out of the carburetor. He had to go back to the pits. And, of course, you guys saw Carpenter. They took him off on a gurney. He looked fine, but just for safekeeping, they're going to take him out and check him out. The 125 West Riders are now at the gate as Jeremy McGrath uh, is checking things out, along with Sebastian Tortelli, Ricky Carmichael there on the right, Jeremy Albrick, the Kawasaki mechanic, for Team Kawasaki, sitting down, relaxing. On the left there is Mike LaRocco. So Jeremy McGrath looks as relaxed as they come. There's David Villeman on the left, just uh, next to Sebastian. He looks even more relaxed, talking with Jeremy. These guys, it, it's cool to see the, the uh, respect for each other because McGrath wants to do nothing more than just annihilate Villeman in this race. Villeman needs to get that 500 grand Vans triple That's crown right. money. and The largest you know, they prize. Are, here they are just mingling before the start. Carmichael soaking it all up. LaRocco sitting down on the ground there. The largest prize in American motorcycle racing is on the line tonight. And uh, Villeman really did the improbable, don't you think? Not only beating the field uh, at the Triple Crown's first two rounds, but he ignored the pressures of having to battle a sports undisputed icon. Let's go back to Davey. All right, Travis, you came out, did exactly what you had to do in the heat race. How do you feel about the main? Well, I feel really confident. I'm doing a couple jumps that no one else on 125 is doing. Really give me a little bit of a lead, but I know Roncata is really quick, and there's the West Coast guys to deal with, too, so it's going to be a knockdown drag out for the main event for sure. But, you know, my arm is running great, got me out to an excellent start, and I'd like to thank, um, you know, Acclaim and No Fear. I just I hope to go out there and win this. This is huge. All right, Travis, so we'll see you in the main. Thanks a lot, Davey. 125 West Riders at the gate right now. Travis Pastrana doing the heel clicker in victory. And we get a shot now uh, coming up uh, of the knack knack. Definitely having fun out there. And you know, I wonder when he does that heel clicker, you see those hand guards right there on his handlebars. Seems like it'd be tough to get his feet back over those things to the pegs. If they get stuck out there, he's in trouble. And the great sportsmanship as the champion of the 125 East, Stefan Brancata, comes up to graduate. But Congratulate the uh, winner. 32nd board is up. Uh, we've got Derek Shea Bentley. Shea Bentley, the champion of the West. David Pinkery lost that championship by only two points. And two time winner Greg Schnell, number 63. You'll see him in the mix. Roger Tain. Casey Lytle, a one time winner. Justin Bucklew, a very fast rider, along with Chris Gossler. The board is sideways. We're ready to go for the second qualifying heat of the 125. Bentley got a slow start. And David Pinkery got in the mix there for the lead. There you can see Shea Bentley, the one number one rider from the West. He ended up caught in that pileup right in the middle, so he's already having to contend with coming from last. It's Mark Burkhardt on the KTM that's out in front. This is the second time that he's got a hole shot in the qualifying round. These KTM guys are doing great off the start. He comes from the outside, just closes everyone in. Looked like Pingree had the whole shot on the way down the starting line, but he decided to break early, take the inside. Didn't really work out for him. Here you can see Bentley right there in the middle, leaned over. He couldn't even get up. He's in running in last place right now. Burkhardt out of the state of Ohio. Won the LCQ in the opener. Qualified for the first four races. His best is in Atlanta. In a longer start. It reminds me of the Houston Astrodome round with one of the other very long starts this season, and the KTM is just seem to hook up great as they get up into fourth gear. There's David Pinkery, number 35, and whoa! He gets a good scrape on the tire that time. And that's his teammate. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what happens, though, going through the loops. Horton had such a run at Pingree, he couldn't really let off, or he could 
fist drop in the front end down from one of those roots he does there and go right over the bars. He had to kind of roll the dice and bump his teammate up to stay on. Robbie Horton also with Bill's Pipe Suzuki, the support team for Team Suzuki, number 61. But I think we survived it. Yeah, he seems to be unaffected. Probably laugh about it a little bit later. I don't think it would have been funny if they hit each other. Look at Horton. He's trying to carry the front wheel right there. Pinkery looks over at him going, what are you doing? You're going to take us out and before we even get going. Horton was one podium on the year, and of course, Pinkery with an outstanding year by for the championship most of the season. There's Pinkery, number 35. Make it up more time. He took advantage right there. Burkhart coming up a little bit short on the double. Pinkery jumped it clean. Not a problem for that. Point. Pinkery in second place, Robbie Horton in third, with Casey Lytle in fourth. And there's the man out in the lead, number 188, Mark Burkhardt. Through the loops, Pinkery leading a train. Burkhardt now in second. And Robbie Horton in third. He had a run at the guys in the loops about halfway through the section, but the problem is everyone's starting to favor the left. And if you're following, you can't make the pass, but he's setting them up here. Great move inside, David. Good call. I could see Burkhardt didn't really have a plan for that corner. He was trying to protect the inside. That's what we saw Evans do in the first heat. It doesn't really work out. And so Pinkley and Robbie Horton one and two now. As they go through that sand section, the mechanics are all on the right of our screen as they come through the riders left. They're trying to deal with some difficult section of racetrack right there and see a signal, find out what they need to do, what position they are, if they're gaining or losing time. Number 63 is behind Burkhart, number 188, and that is Greg Schnell. Schnell had an outstanding season. If it hadn't been for a couple of double, double digit races, he won two races this year, and there goes Schnell making the move on Burkhart. It seems like the start is that big of a deal. Riders are able to find their way around out here. Some of the guys are talking about how it's hard to pass out here after yesterday's practice. They made some changes to the track, and it seems to be working perfect. Incidentally, the champion of this division, the 125 West Chief, is way back in the position. Battling the stomach flu or some stomach ailment, he was sick all day today and got the bad start early. That's too bad. You don't want to debut your number one plate like that. Got more the battle teammates. for fifth is on. Number 30 is Casey Lytle. Number 42 is Danny Smith. And Danny Smith was injured throughout much of the year. It's the battle for fourth is on. Lytle is in fourth. This is an interesting straightaway. There's so many different ways to get through there. You've been calling those rhythm sections. I don't think call it an auction section this way. Look at the number 195, Billy Payne of Pro Circuit. He gets by Danny Smith. Last chance to put in a great performance, build up a little momentum and confidence for the outdoor season coming up soon. And Billy Payne there, number 195, looked excellent in practice. He didn't, he didn't run the rest, last race in Dallas. As we go back toward the leaders now, and it's a battle between teammates. And think about this, they just about took each other out. Not too long ago through the whoop section that they're now approaching. And here they are running first and second. That was a little stroke of luck. What the energy it takes. They're just fighting so hard to get through that whoop section. And somebody like Pinkery, he's trying as hard as he can to get through there, and he's losing time to his teammate. Let's think about that the next lap either. their way down in there. You can see how slick it's starting to get already. They're on the brakes early. They just slide sideways all the way to that burn. That's the only thing that stops them. Pinkery's got to be hungry for this race, David Bailey, because it's really the heartbreak of the season. Uh, twice he led the 125 West in points, only to lose the title by two points. A great disappointment. He's battled through injury after injury over the last few years. And to beat the contention for the title and not to win it, uh, it really affected him. That hurts. And a similar thing happened to Sellers. Uh, in the East, he led the title the whole way. He was the most consistent guy, and to lose it in the end feels bad. I, I was always fortunate and able to win it in the end. But I, I've, I've lost a few things, and nothing like a title, and I can't imagine how disappointing that would be. Here's the battle for fourth, and it's on right now. It's Casey Lytle and Billy Payne. Billy Payne on the green bike, going to the outside, trying to take Casey Lytle. in the mix with Danny Smith and Chris Gossler as well. There are no lines left. 
now you can see uh, number 158, Jason, Justin Bucker is starting to catch this pack. Look at number 55, Gosler, making a big move on the inside. Gets around Billy Payne, the white flag lap is on. This is the final lap of our 125 West qualifying round. Lionel number 30, Danny Smith, by the bar with Gosler, 55 and 32. Billy Payne is right behind him, and Buckaloo behind Payne. This is going to be good because it, these guys aren't racing for points right now. This is a one-shot deal. It's for pride. These guys want to build momentum. Put their stamp on the end of the season if they weren't able to get a win or a title. They want to prove it right here that they're the fast guy. And they, they, things may have been different if they look like this the rest of the season. Lytle continues to lead this great train. One of six riders to win his very first 125 Supercross this year. Billy Payne catching this trio right here. A lap ago, he was up in the thick of it. Made a little mistake through this section. Oh, Lytle. Whoa. Gets a little bit offline. Nice recovery. Had the inside. Look at Gosler. Gosler comes to the inside as the checkered flag is out for Pingree. But a one, two, three battle right here with Honda. After Pingree, Horton. But it's Lytle, Smith, and Gosler just battling it out down the loops with Payne in back there. There's Lytle number 30. Gosler, Danny Smith tries to cut it tight, but Lytle holds on. Oh, great race in our second qualifying round for the 125s. David Pingree, our winner, but the battle really was for fourth, fifth, and sixth with Casey Lytle, Chris Gosler, and Danny Smith. And the honors, number 61, Robbie Horton taking second. Let's go down to Davey. Thanks, Arn. I'm with Sean Yulikowski. Sean, I know that David just won that race, but you guys got to talk about that triple jump. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a big factor with Pastrana jumping it and stuff. So uh, we're going to go back to the pits, and I'll tell him about it. I think he can do it. He just was probably checking it out because he hasn't done it all day. Has David been refocusing on this race? I know that the 125 West title was, it was almost there for him. Then he had all those crashes in a row. I know that was a bitter pill to swallow in Dallas. Yeah, we had some bad luck a couple races. We came up real short, and uh, he just wants to win tonight to prove himself that maybe put an explanation point. Maybe that one W should have been his. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. David Pingree, our winner, as we take a look at the wrenchhead.com results page. David Pingree. Robbie Horton in second place, Greg Schnell qualifying, Casey Lytle in fourth, Chris Gossler in fifth, Danny Smith in sixth, Billy Payne seventh, Justin Buckaloo qualifies for the main event in eighth, and Shea Bentley came all the way back toward the back of the pack to barely qualify for the main event in ninth. Let's go back down track side. I get done with his interview, but I got to tell you guys, I was watching the back. Christopher Gosler was flying. He almost went off the track a couple times. I don't know about you, David, but Gosler looks like he's on fire tonight. He is fast. And I'll tell you what surprises me is yesterday in the practice, he had a pretty bad crash. Completely stopped, got off the bike, just left the bike sitting there, was holding his wrist. They were worried he may have broken it, sprained it, and here he is out here today. And in the one section, it seems like it would hurt his wrist the most is through the whoops, and he's going through there faster than anyone. Let's go down to Robbie Floyd. Actually, you got me. Well, last year's champions really disappointed right now. You went down on that first straightaway, Ernesto Fonseca, and you look very determined out there tonight. You worked your way up into seventh. Yeah, I feel really good. You know, my box working really good, and uh, every everybody's working really hard for for the team to be up front, and I think uh, I feel really good out there tonight. Um, I think I just need to get a better start, and uh, I wouldn't have any problem being uh, up there in the, in the top three places. Well, you talk about those guys looking aggressive. Davey Coombs, uh, I'm telling you, Ernesto's a guy who really wants to prove himself just like he did last week at Chicago. And you know what? So does David Pingree. And David, you just made a very bold statement in that second 125 heat. Yeah, you know, that's the 125 main event right there. And uh, that's the way it should have been all year. You know, I just got through the first turn clean, and my Suzuki did the rest of the work. It was a piece of cake. What about Pastrana in the main? You think you got the pace? Uh, he's going fast. I'm going to have to take it up a whole other level. So uh, I'll just see what I can do when the time comes. Robbie Floyd was talking back with Fonseca back in the pit area. And Davy Coombs, of course, down on the victory stand talking with uh, David Pingree uh, for the final race of the one, uh, the 250 season as we take a look at the wrenchhead.com results presented by Toyota Trucks. David Pingree, Horton Schnell, Lytle, Gosler, the top five, and qualifying all the way down to Shea Bentley, Roger Tain, the Frenchman on the KTM, will have to go to the last chance qualifier. 
as we get set for our first 250 qualifying round. It's the final race, believe it or not, of the 250 season. It seemed like it came awfully quick. And this is Heath Boss with the onboard camera. The race format is the same as usual. The top four riders out of the two qualifying heats in the 250s go directly to the main. The top five in the semis qualify, and then the top two from the LCQ. 20 riders will be on the final gate. Our first qualifying heat is underway. David Villan and Mike LaRocco in this one. We've had some unusual hole shooters lately, but it's David Villeman taking the top spot with Mike LaRocco, a great start. Mike LaRocco in a three-way battle for second place. Heath Boss's cam right there. That helmet cam providing us a good insight into the action of what it feels like, David. Well, this is what Boss doesn't want to see, is all these riders between himself and the leaders. He's going to have to do a lot of work to get right into the main event. He's in the top four. Huffman and Tortelli. Trailing Morocco and Villeman. Villeman just up over that triple. Already starting to stretch his lead. That was awesome in practice. McGrath jumped in behind him. Actually lost a little bit of time. Pulled off, was watching what Villeman was doing. Very creative out here. Comes up short there, but he's, he's comfortable enough to try things on the racetrack. Looks back at Morocco right there. I know I made a mistake. Yeah. That's the closest you're going to get. LaRocco now banging on the door of David Villeman. Villeman's got that $500,000 at stake. He needs a good qualifying position. He does, and LaRocco really doesn't like Villeman that much. He's said that. Anything he can do to get around. And LaRocco's a physical rider, too. If he's got an opportunity and Villeman leaves the door open, well, I don't know if he's going to walk through it. I think he's going to oh, he bang knows, it open yes, more. Yes, he knows how to scratch the plastic. That's for sure. Look at the battle for third on David Huffman and Sebastian Tortelli, number 21. He's putting the challenge to Huffman right now. Great recovery by Huffman there. He went off the jump, front end washed out, both feet off the pegs. He's able to land in the line and not lose any time. He's got Tortelli breathing down his neck. One more mistake like that, and he'll lose a position. Sebastian Tortelli finishing uh, sixth so far in the points where he would like to move up a notch to the top five. That's what he was looking for going into the season. David Huffman having a very, oh, I should say, mediocre year for him with one podium on the season. He had an injury. That there goes just, Tortelli. Tortelli making the pass, David. Nice block pass. Now, Tortelli also looks great in practice. This is the time of year when Tortelli starts thinking about the outdoors. He starts building his momentum. He had his best supercross season ever, but he wasn't able to jump a key triple out there because Huffman wasn't. Now he'll be able to do it. It's interesting to see if he can catch the leaders. In the last race in Chicago, so Tortelli coming off of fifth in a very steady ride there in Chicago. His best was a second at Pontiac. That was the first race at Pontiac in the two. He also took a second in the heat and got a great start in third. Here in the qualifying round, Tortelli in third place behind Larocco and Villama. See Craig right there, number 43, starting to close in a little bit on Damon Huffman. Huffman's going to have to start jumping a couple things out there. Otherwise, he's going to be in jeopardy of not making this main event. Because Mike Craig's the kind of guy that will come in there and steal it from him. The back section is very interesting as we go back to our leader, David Villeman, number 934. You see that 109 lap time? That's just ridiculous. Uh, earlier in the day, they were running around 111, 112. The track's in a little bit better shape right now with some extra water on it. He's hooking up out there. And McGrath and the rest of the field are on the starting line watching this right now, knowing that they have to get on their game tonight run with this guy. He rode so fast last week, coming from last to second. He's on a roll. You know, this is the our sports answer to the lottery, really. The odds are about the same that this guy can take the $500,000 winning a three selected races in the man's triple crown. If he does not win, if McGrath wins, Villeman still has a shot at the consolation prize, but he has to get a fourth or better. And that consolation's a mere 25 grand. Just, just 25 grand. And my, and back when I was racing, they had this thing called the Miller Masters and the Wrangler Dash. Those were worth 30 and 25 grand, and nothing like what they've got going on. Great time to be a motocross racer. The number 934 certainly had a great first full season in 250 action. He's never been out of the top six, and only three times he hasn't made the podium. He's uh, second in almost every statistical category, second to Jeremy McGrath. Pretty impressive. Ran that corner feet on the pegs. Great balance. Approaching the triple. Kind of squats down to keep the bike low. And now he's approaching the whoop. Watch him through here. This guy is so fast in the whoops. Wheelies a little bit at the beginning just to keep that bike flat. 
Stays right on the tops of it. No mistakes yet. Starting to pull away with number five and number 21 in third. Let's go back to number 21. Let's go on board with Dean Boss and check out his vision. This is through the whoop section. You saw the runners ahead of him. Rotelli, Billman get through there. He gets through there no problem. Look at the big finish line double. About 55 feet up into the berm. Then it gets real slippery right here. This is where the start comes into the first corner. Billman a moment ago just moving all those tough blocks up off the top of that berm. Tough rhythm section right there. You got to get off over those plateaus over another jump. This is the mechanics area on the left to get your signal. And while you're trying to negotiate the sand and head out of the stadium, you get to air things out a little bit. Well, that's there. a short space to check out a pit for it. Yeah, you really got to you gotta be looking for it all the way. Oh, <laughs> as soon as you come out of that corner, if you make any kind of a mistake, you don't have time to look at it. This is heading back in. This is what the guys out front are tripling. So he won't be able to triple this. He doubles it right there. He'll double this one into the corner, try to save a little time. I like this section here. Whoops, with a double in the middle, more whoops into the corner. Very tricky. There's no way to take that. I saw McGrath do something earlier. I only did it once. I didn't want anyone to get a video camera on him and have anybody else figure that out. He's just saving it for the main event. Heath Boss, number 33, our helmet man. He's the top privateer so far this year, both in standing as well as money. He's made over $13,000 in his SFX privateer fund bonus money. I love looking at this shot. It's gotten so much better over the years. It took a long time to perfect it. Other than shaking around just a little bit, your, your head does shake like that when you're out there. You so. Here we go, Mark. That's all. Trying to find a way around it. Thought he might get a speed fire on the inside back there, but he just got closed off. Have a look at Billum in the last lap he posted was a 111, so that 109 is his best yet. He hasn't matched it since. David Villeman making the first statement here in the opening 250 qualifying round. He pulls away to lead and possibly win. Jeremy McGrath will be coming up in the second qualifying round. You see behind Villeman, Morocco is still there. Pretty close. Didn't make a major mistake by Villeman or an excellent charge from Morocco at the late stages here to force the issue. Morocco's been known to do that. He gets stronger as the race goes on. He's a little bit of a slow starter, not just out of the hole shot. You saw he was second there, but the first couple of laps of the race, he always loses time. He's supposed to have to make it up the rest of the race. He's going to make up time on a guy like Villain. Well, Rocco might not have won a Supercross since 1995, but he certainly has had a very steady year as he's in second place and Villain is pulling away from him right now. But second place locked up out of the first qualifying heat will give him a good gate selection. I don't know that it's that important. I think what they're trying to do right now is figure out the, the lines of the racetrack where it's going to be a little slippery later. And they might want to change from running the left side of a straightaway to more in the middle or the right, have opportunities to pass. Rocco is just an excellent runner. He's been out here for so long. He's always up front. He doesn't get the wins that you see McGrath get, but the guy is so steady. And uh, been a rookie year for quite a while, but David Billiman as he takes the white flag in the final lap. David Billiman, our leader here in the opening qualifying round. Billiman is looking for his fifth win of the season, and I, you know, five hundred thousand dollars is a lot of francs, about three million five hundred thousand French francs, but. You know, I think he'd be very prideful if he won another race because that would mean he would tie his boyhood hero, Jean-Michel Bale, in Bale's first rookie season of also all five races. If you win five races to a hero like that in Villeman's uh, native land would be quite a prestigious accomplishment. He's got a lot of motivation to make. He definitely wants to win. He's very focused. Vegas is a place that can... Uh, have you wandering off in different directions? There's so many things to do, so many temptations, and he does seem very focused. He wants to win this. He's trying to get to five wins. He also wants to win the 500 grand. And if he can win it, I think it'll sort of make that uh, loss last weekend in McGrath not being able to take this championship down to the final round a little bit easier. Billman has been such a humble rider, and especially very respectful to Jeremy McGrath. But you think uh, as the checkered flag is waving now for David Billman? the winner of our first qualifying round. But my question to you, David, is why are so many riders uh, against Villeman winning this $500,000?
I just think they don't like somebody coming over here from another country and <laughs> whooping us. You the know? balance of payments, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, as Heath Boss battling in fifth position is one position from qualifying from the main event going through those whoops. And going across the finish line, taking the checkered flag. Heath Boss won't be able to take it home with him, but Davy Combs, David Villeman will. He just might, and that's what I'm going to ask his mechanic, Craig. Was he even talking about that money this week? You know, he's been real focused this week on outdoors. He hasn't even been really that concerned with the money. You know, he's happy with getting second in the series. You know, everyone seems to be playing it up for the money, but he hasn't really said too much. Well, then what about this? It's his last chance to beat Jeremy McGrath in a Supercross in his first year over here. He's focused on that tonight. More than anything, he wants to win the race. Thanks, Craig. Sure. Win the race, you win the $500,000. It's all the same as he's taken on Jeremy McGrath, who wins 56% of the time. And taking a look now at the Suzuki results page, Villaman, Rocco Tortelli, and Huffman have qualified for the main event. Heath Voss will go on to the semifinal round for the 250s before a chance at the main event. David Villaman surprised the seven-time champion, uh, Jeremy McGrath, at Phoenix, catching up and passing him. And then he came back David Bailey to lead every lap at Minneapolis where Jeremy had never lost a race. He won every race in the seven years they've staged a race there. But number 934 right here just took him on and won it. Well, Billman is the kind of guy that if he gets a great start, you, you're going to have to earn it. He is not going to make a mistake. He's not going to fold under the pressure. And that's what Jeremy's been able to count on with the rest of these guys. But Villeman didn't grow up here in the States. He didn't grow up fearing that guy right there, number one, McGrath. You know, people have asked me, uh, hey, McGrath's won the title. He doesn't need the money. Would Jeremy concede one to Villeman? Well, the answer is obviously he concedes nothing. And uh, he just ca cares about winning. Winning is the true source of motivation for this guy. Now he loves it. Let's go back to Davy Coombs' track side. All right, David, the first step's down. You won your heat race. Now you can focus on that last 20 laps, that half million dollars. Yeah, it should be tough, you know. It's pretty hot here, and the track is very difficult, very slippery. It should be a tough race, and uh, nobody wants me to win this money. So uh, we'll see uh, a good race tonight. Okay, good luck in the main, David. Thanks a lot, David. He seems a little preoccupied with that right now, David Bailey, as we get set for our second half. And, of course, our second qualifying heat has Jeremy McGrath, Kevin Windham, Ricky Carmichael, Larry Ward, Kyle Lewis, Grayson Goodman. Ronnie Clark and a whole host of other riders that are going to try to make the top four and get into the main event. There's Larry Ward, number 10, next to Jeremy. See Grayson Goodman right there, number 65. Grayson gets excellent starts. I'm actually see if he can beat McGrath in the first corner. Wouldn't that be something? On the other side of McGrath is number 777, Ronnie Clark from Farmington, New Mexico on the Yamaha. The board is sideways. Our second qualifying heat is underway. Wyndham with a great start. Team Honda's number 14, but here comes Jeremy McGrath. And a big pile up in the first turn. And Grayson Goodman, who got into the first corner right there with Wyndham and McGrath, got caught at the bottom of that pile up. There's Wyndham number 14 to Jeremy McGrath as he go outside the stadium to go over the tunnel jump. Well, this ought to be good. McGrath does not like to lose even in a heat race. So Wyndham's going to have some company. We'll find out if he can pass out here. Let's check out the start and see what happened on that melee in the first turn. Well, Grayson doesn't really have much room right there. He's just trying to balance at the top of the berm. He couldn't reach the ground, and he fell right over, and he was underneath a stack of bikes right there while McGrath, his best friend, he was lined up near, was out there chasing Wyndham. The front runners made it through. Number 14, Kevin Wyndham, leading this qualifying heat. Number one, Jeremy McGrath, right behind him. A little bit better line by Wyndham after the corner approach the triple than McGrath. He'll make a note of that. And Ricky Carmichael, number four, on the team, Kawasaki in third. Carmichael wants to get up in there and join this race. It's nothing worse than knowing that you have to speed around with these guys but not getting the start. And you hear in the crowd react for the battle out front. You're not part of it. Ricky wants to get in there. Kevin Wyndham has won five heat races this year and some of those against Jeremy McGrath. During a crucial time, there you see Ricky Carmichael in third place with Larry Ward in fourth. Those are the qualifying positions right now as the second leading privateer is in fifth spot, Kyle Lewis. Out front is number 14, Kevin Wyndham. 
Coming off his fourth straight podium, including a win at Texas Stadium. Can he hold on to seven-time champion? Look at that. McGrath does a little wheelie right before that triple. He sets the front end down. That starts the forks. Just like a pogo stick, they bounce more and he gets more lift off that jump. The takeoff is about four feet lower than where they have to land. A lot of finesse right there by McGrath to get over that. Do you think he's going to give anything away before the main event here? He's going to want to win no matter what. I don't think he's going to save any fast lines. He's just going to try to put the pressure on Kevin, force him into a mistake. Kevin is holding his own right now after the frustrating season. Nine, eight non-podium. Kevin is rebounded, showing he's got his old potential back. He's definitely the best. You see how hard and slick it is. We always talk about the great throttle of control. Kevin, of course, a lot of the top riders have it, but Kevin just seems to be able to deliver it a little bit better at times. And right here, he's starting to inch away from McGrath. That last lap of 109, the same exact lap time as well in the first heat. And I think these guys are going to get a little quicker because McGrath's going to have to turn it up. Jeremy McGrath, in his fifth season with nine or more wins. I'd like to get number 10 tonight. A little weird again. These guys are going so fast to to jump that triple. They, they built, built some whoop to do down the back side to try to discourage them from jumping it. They don't care, they're jumping anyway. The line from Wyndham, he's able to go out there, double up onto that plateau and triple off. McGrath taking the inside, he has to use a different timing. He's not really losing as much time as I thought he did. He'll stay pretty close. Well, you can really tell how slippery it is, uh, especially exiting the whoops. They use the burn there. Pitch the back end out to the right, sets him up to go all the way in wide. And a good run off of the berm after the finish because it's so slippery right when they hit the flat. The hard pack of the soil here in Las Vegas, very similar to those that the players practice on in California. Look at that sand right there. If you're anywhere near the guy in front of you, you just get showered with it. It goes all down in your jersey, in your helmet, in your face. Look at that. Window just wide open on the power on the back side of that big tunnel jump there. These guys could be on a dirt track somewhere, Winnie. That is so technical, so hard to do. There's not very many guys doing it. It makes it that much more impressive to know that the 250 guys are having to use everything they've got to get over it. There's a strong on it's 125 and still able to jump. Kevin Wyndham has led this entire qualifying round. It's the second 250 qualifying round. Part of the Honda crew looking on as Kevin Wyndham, his mechanic is Ali Seymour, an experienced rider himself before getting into the mechanic side. You hear Kevin working that throttle, up, 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 all the way through that whoop section, knowing when to get on the throttle, when to back out of it to keep that bike level. As soon as the front wheel drops into one of those, you start that up and down motion, lose all your forward momentum. That's what's been happening to McGrath. I have a feeling he's going to make a suspension change. Ali Seymour actually was changing spokes during the week on the bike. Fractured the hand or arm. That's too bad. And so Kevin's got a big repair this week. It's not often you see them. <laughs> yeah, even though Ali's on the scene. <laughs> Talking with Randy Lawrence, Jeremy McGrath. Anthony Pascio giving Larry Ward his signal on the way by. Running in fourth. Only a seconds down. Two minutes. I'd like to see him up close so he can study what these guys are doing. Wouldn't that be something? Ali sits out a race, and uh, Ron Wood comes in to rent for uh, Kevin Windham, and uh, he takes it. Well, you know, Cliff White, the team manager, wasn't able to make Dallas. It's funny because Kevin won the race, and Ali called him afterwards and said, we won, and Cliff's like, come on. They're always joking with him. He didn't believe him at first. Maybe this is a good omen. Maybe they got somebody missing, and they can kind of go back and remember what happened in Dallas and use that to their advantage mentally. Last lap by Kevin Window, 106. That's why he has stretched his lead over McGrath. McGrath has got to be shocked right now. He's going as fast as Billman was, and he's getting dropped. And faster here in the second third qualifying. Uh, the qualifying winner going to the right. This is, this is really surprising. I knew Kevin had the speed. Uh, I've always known that. Uh, I didn't think he had this much speed. I think McGrath right now may be just starting to say, well, you know what, obviously, I need to make up more time. He'll probably, he'll probably make some changes to his bike to get that boot section a little flatter and 
not have to worry about that so much. If you have one section on the track that's bothering you, it tends to take up some space in your head all the way around the rest of the track. And wearing on him right now, he's losing time. Kevin Wood is really grinding it out. As we heard in the audience, Kevin was missed at the, uh, the way Philippe got by last lap in Chicago and really scraped him pretty hard to move on second place. And it was a last lap situation, so Philippe wasn't really back to lead, but back, it looks like he's coming back with a vengeance right now. Yeah, but some guys need to get motivated. If he's got to use that to do it, well, that's fine. Rob Hanna was the same way towards the end of his career. Ron Wood holding out the board, saying, focus, Kevin. There was a time at, towards the end of the career when uh, Hanna's career, we were both on Honda. Uh, Hanna would be asking, asking me, what gear are you doing that jump over there in? And I'm thinking, oh, Hurricane Hanna's asking me what gear. And then all of a sudden, somebody would get a little close to him, bump him, and he would get motivated to go out and win the race. Just completely turn it around. He's so mental amongst these top four or five guys. They can all do the same things, but the guy that's got his head in this and is focused the most is going to be the one that can put in those turns. Wow. Well, Wyndham has just refused to crack under the pressure of Jeremy McGrath, and now McGrath is just on his own pace. Well, Kevin is back to town a little bit. Listen to the throttle through there. So hard to keep your balance. The tops of those are all so slippery. He's backed it down to 110 lap time, which is about what Billman was doing towards the later stages of his race. Kevin's not threatened here, so he can afford to do that. Kevin on the final lap of the qualifying round. They were working on this section all day yesterday and all day today. They're now tripling into the corner before the sand. Gonna feel good for Kevin if you go out there and pull away from the draft like this. I haven't seen this all year. Kevin won the 1997-125 shootout here on Yamaha. He was injured the last two years while riding 250, so number 14. Really trying to make his 250 here in Las Vegas. Take that, Miller. <laughs> Take that McGrath. He's out there showing off in front of the best rider in Supercross history. Having it his way. This will be a big boost for Kevin. And I've talked with Jeff Stanton, who works with all the Honda guys. And he's the time can kind of go back and forth. And he's real up and he's real down. And right now he's got to be on the That's great news. Breaking a 20 race losing streak, and boy, did that pump some adrenaline and confidence into this young man. Number 14, Kevin Windham taking the checkered flag, and here comes Jeremy McGrath, number one, taking a second seat behind Windham. Let's check in with Davey Coombs. Well, I'm with the replacement mechanic here, the utility man for Honda, Ron Wood. Ron? Great way to start your season, but of course it's the last race of the year. Yeah, it is. Uh, Allie, his regular mechanic, broke his wrist at the shop the other day, and so I've been stepping in, and with Kevin, it's just a pleasure. He's so easy to work with and so horribly fast. Well, I tell you what, it looks like he's got that speed on him tonight. He's got his A game here. What was he talking about earlier today? Well, the thing with Kevin, he doesn't talk a lot about racing. He just goes out there and figures it out, and then he just doesn't want to think about it much. He just wants to be loose and have fun, and then that makes him go fast. Ron, well, maybe you'll get your first Supercross win later tonight. That'd be great. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Good way to start a career as far as uh, Ron Wood is concerned as he goes back to the pits now to get ready and break that uh, bike down as we take a look at the Honda results page. Kevin Windham, Jeremy McGrath, Ricky Carmichael finishing in third, and Larry Ward going directly to the main event out of the qualifier, taking a fourth place. The rest of the riders going on to the semifinal round. A sellout crowd here at Sam Boyd Stadium in Las Vegas anticipating all kinds of fireworks tonight, David Bailey. I think we've already seen the stage properly set for some great competition. Let's go to Robbie Floyd. We know this race is really important for bike setup. Now check out the clutch lever on Mike LaRocco's bike. He likes it up a lot higher than anybody else. Him and Shea Bentley pretty much started this trend. He thinks when he gets back on the bike, he's able to go through the whoop section a little bit faster than everybody else. Well, that seems to be one of the problems also for LaRocco. Paul, his mechanic, says he come back and said he's having a problem with the whoops. He wants to stay on top of them a little bit more, so he's going to slow down the rebound and see if that solves the problem. Thank you, Robbie. Robbie's back in the pits, and that's an important place to have a camera because a lot of action goes back there, that's for sure. But also some action right now down on the victory podium with Davey Coombs. 
Well, Kevin, your new mechanic, Ron Wood, just said it best. You are so fast tonight. I feel great, you know, and I'm really looking forward to the outdoor seasons, but I can't forget about this uh, last Supercross here. And, uh, you know, nothing against Villeman, but I'd, I'd love to be the, the spoiler of that whole half-million-dollar deal. And uh, you know, my bike's feeling great tonight, and uh, hopefully I can do it. Well, let me ask you about that half-million thing. I know that last week at the race in Chicago, you weren't very happy with Villeman after the final lap. Yeah, I, I was a little hot, and, uh, you know, he, he made a very aggressive aggressive pass, and uh, I was, mark it down in my little notebook and uh, if I ever get the chance again well then you know, I guess I got to retaliate but uh, he, he's a great rider and he was just going for second place and he came from way behind so you know forget about the past let's race tonight what is it about this track you seem like you're going really good tonight I think I have very uh, smooth throttle control and this track out here is definitely taking it tonight uh, you know, my Honda and, and Dunlop tires are working great tonight but uh, you know, whenever you get on this, this asphalt style dirt you know it's hard to get anything to hook up so you know, hopefully I can do it tonight and just uh, get out there, be smooth, and uh, work the throttle in the clutch right. Well, a series of mid-season fades had him completely in the dark as to what he was doing wrong, but right here in Las Vegas right now, you can tell this kid is charged up. He seems to be on that zone where we saw him in Dallas other times during the year where he just is able to run away. It's, if he could just jar that up and use it every time, it's, sometimes you lose that and it's hard to get it back. It's all confidence out there. And, Right now, Kevin's operating on a lot more confidence than anyone else. Ricky Carmichael, you see him coming across the finish line. Uh, that was a lapper, number 53, Terlecki, in front of him. And uh, Elvis is in the house. You can, can we tell we're in Vegas right now? <laughs> There's no mistake about it. Get the feather out of his eye. <laughs> now, we're not looking at Elvis, I don't think, though. <laughs> uh, this is a great place to finish an outstanding season of uh, EA Sports Supercross. There's no question about that. The party atmosphere, but also so much money on the line and a lot of prestige comes out of this final race of the year. And what a season it's been for Yamaha. Uh, they totally dominated the 250 ranks this year with McGrath and Villeman uh, winning their contests. The pair contested for the championship right down to the last week in Chicago. It always helps to have the world's greatest supercross rider on your bike if you're looking for a banner year. But if you're lucky enough to also have the year's second leading winner, it can mean the greatest Supercross season ever. Such is the case this year for Yamaha, as Jeremy McGrath and David Pillman combined for 13 wins in the 15 races. Well, it's a little unique in the sense that, um, you know, we, we have two teams, basically, that we need to support. Um, we're there 100% for Jeremy with the um, equipment and everything, and so coordinating that. Um, Steve Butler is the guy on our team, from the factory team, that coordinates with Chaparral to um, work specifically with Jeremy, and then, then he's also involved uh, with our team, as, as me and everybody else are. But, um, you know, it's just a unique situation that we have an outside team and the factory team, and uh, both sides are winning their share of races, and uh, we're first and second in the championship, and, um, you know, it's a dream come true, I think, for everybody involved. It's been 20 years since Team Yamaha set the previous record of 12 wins in a season. Ironically, it was without the services of the great Bob Hanna. Mike Bell stepped it up for seven wins. Brock Glover captured the checkers four times. And Rex Staten won Daytona. Well, I guess you have to start with the previous year that Bob Hanna was a Supercross champion for Yamaha in uh, 77, 78, 79. In the summer of 79, uh, he ended up breaking his leg wider scheme and... Um, you know, we had Mike Bell on the team, and Rex Staten and Rod Glover, I believe, were the riders. And, uh, you know, I, I remember Mike Bell ended up being the champion. And, uh, you know, we talked about his work habits and what he needed to do that he could win the championship, especially without Bob there. You know, there was a lot of opportunity for a lot of riders. And, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to have a team that stepped up to the plate with uh, three riders winning races and winning those 12 events. And Bell going on to win the championship. Um, it's every team's dream that when the main guys or guy, as it may be, um, isn't there, that everybody else steps up and uh, you know, does what they're capable of doing. A big reason for Yamaha's success this year has been the technical and mechanical crews. But Keith McCarty's maneuvering when faced with losing riders like Jeff Emig, Ezra Lusk, and Kevin Windham was also a big key to the success this year. It was a good thing for Yamaha and I think Jeremy too that um, you know that we had a team that could put together this type of program um, you know again this was the beginning for us of the outside team that we um, were assisting and uh, you know this is the third year of that um, scenario I believe and uh, it's 
worked out very well. I mean, he's kind of been a team leader for even our factory team. You know, he's really a good guy to have around and uh, to, to bring your team up. So, um, you know, and then this year with David Dorman being involved and uh, winning a lot of events, uh, you know, as well and being second in the series. Um, you know, I think that everybody hopes that their team can work in this way, you know. It's probably best for the brand that there's multiple winners because it shows the strength of the bike and not just one individual, you know. I mean, this year for us, it's working out very well that way. Excellence at every level has given Yamaha the edge entering the new century. An incredible year for Yamaha. And as you see Jeremy McGrath inside his 18-wheeler back at the pits now, they're discussing with Larry Brooks on the left uh, the strategy, what happened out there. Let's go down right now to uh, Robbie Floyd, who is with Randy Lawrence, and he's the wrencher of Jeremy McGrath. Right. Uh, Randy, normally you say you don't have that many fixes in between the heat race and the main event, but it's a little bit different tonight. You're saying you have a little problem with traction. Going to make a change? Yeah, a little bit. Um, we actually went to a different tire. We haven't ran this in a race. Uh, and, uh, we, Me and uh, the guy from Bridgestone, we talked a little bit about it, and uh, we thought it would be good for the start and some of the obstacles on the course, the way the dirt was looking. But uh, it looked like it was getting a little side to side in the whoops. What made you want to change, you know, first time ever coming out here? You knew you could go back to it in the main event? Yeah, we knew we could go back in the main event. It's a tire we haven't tried in a race. We looked at the conditions, thought it might be better. And it was, it did work well on the other parts of the course, except the whoops. They're really hard and slick on top. And uh, with the other tire, we think we're going to get a little bit better drive and a little straighter line through there with that. Well, Art, I guess that's why they're number one out there, always trying to find something new. And uh, again, trying it for the first time here tonight, but they're going back to Old Faithful. Robbie, it's so valuable having you back in the pits to get that information for us. While Yamaha was dominating the 250 ranks, winning the 125 East Championship was not quite as easy. But thanks to a spectacular performance by Stefan Roncata, not one, but two more trophies will be added to the company's racing collection. In a season that saw the sport's future superstars reach a parody that was only a Pete Rozelle dream for the NFL, one rider stood out from the rest to capture four victories. Stefan Roncata. In the past, there were those who felt that this likable Frenchman had the speed but questioned his physical and mental toughness, key elements in winning a title. But he came into this season in the best shape of his life after off-season arm pump surgery. A crash with his teammate Ernesto Fonseca took away a possible podium in the 125 Eastern opener, but then he survived a spectacular crash in qualifying to lead every lap at Pontiac, becoming the seventh different rider to win in the first seven 125 races. I had surgery on my arms last year. My arm pumps are gone now. It's not an excuse anymore. And I'm happy I can prove to that I can win without letting go at the end. So that's one of the best nights of my life. I mean, I'm so happy right now. Stefan then became the East Division's first two-time winner, leading all but three laps in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm so happy right now. I don't know what to say. My Yamaha of is working great. I'm making you did a great job. <laughs> this is the best. I had a good start. Took the lead. I was looking at it just to crash, but I know it's the race. I'm happy I won tonight. Despite being 10 points off the lead in third place with three races to go, Roncata seemed to thrive on the pressure of a three-rider battle for the championship. He never got a whole shot during the season, but masterfully picked his way through to the lead. Once in the lead, he didn't crack. Back-to-back -back wins in Pontiac and New Orleans threw him into a tie with Brock Sellers in the points race, with Travis Pastrana just six points back. Once again, the cool of an otherwise excitable Stefan Roncata showed through. A second-place finish behind his teammate Ernesto Fonseca gave him his first American professional title. Maybe it feels so good. I don't know if it's sweat or... Tears on my face right now, but amazing, you know, I couldn't wait for that, and it happened tonight. I don't know what to say, it's just like Shay did two, a couple weeks ago. What? Stefan Roncata really trying to imitate Shay Bentley's scream there at the end, David Bailey. Uh, couldn't quite get to the pitch in a, a French scream like uh, like the Georgia scream from Bentley. No, I don't think anyone's going to match Shay Bentley. He even topped uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting ready for the last chance qualifiers for the 125s, both in the east and the west. You see Robbie Skaggs, number 115 there out of Lawrence, Kansas, on the Husqvarna. He's got the Joseph Aloff. Kelly Smith, also an important rider on the KTM number 41. Hawthorne, Wheeler, Carpenter, Curry, DeHaan, and Jason Fink. Inside Jeremy's trailer. Back of the pits, 
got the shirt off. He's sitting down, relaxing. Such an important evening, and we've got one of his best friends, if not his best friend, sitting right next to us now, Jimmy Button, as we take a look at the ready for the start of the 125 lineup of the last chance qualifier. Right now, Kelly Smith, number 41, edging out in front of the last chance qualifier. And I think what all the fans around the United States want to know is just how you're feeling, Jimmy Button, as number 115, Robbie Skaggs, takes the lead in the last chance qualifier. Got a little trouble getting you on mic, uh, Jimmy. Jimmy Button, it's great to see you after that tragic accident in uh, Phoenix, Arizona.